Welcome to the Ayan Hirsi Ali podcast, a home for critical thinking and common sense. Today on the podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Yasmin Mohammed. Yasmin is a Canadian human rights activist who fights for the rights of women living within Muslim-majority countries, as well as those who struggle under religious fundamentalism in general. She founded the non-profit Free Hearts, Free Minds, which provides mental health support for members of the LGBT community and free thinkers living within Muslim-majority countries. Her memoir, Unveiled, tells of her experiences growing up in a fundamentalist Islamic household and her arranged marriage to a member of Al-Qaeda. Yasmin, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Ayan. I'm so grateful and honored to be here. So Yasmin, before we start, you and I know one another. We've been friends and we've also been comrades in our activism, struggling pretty much against the same forces. But my audience either don't know you or know very little about you. And I am just so proud and so excited to have this conversation so that they get to know you better. I've read your memoir, so I know your story. Still, I wanted to start with your childhood. You were born in Canada to a mother from Egypt and a father from Palestine. There's one interesting nugget of information there that I want to explore more, which is your mother was the niece of the former pre- one of the former presidents of Egypt, Mohammed Najib. And how did she find herself in Canada, married to a Palestinian? Do you want to tell me that story? Sure. Um, so it turns out that my mother was a bit of a troublemaker. <laughs> so maybe that's where I get it, it from. in the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Um, At the time, people from Palestine were allowed, excuse me, they were allowed all of the rights of citizenship of Egyptians except for citizenship. So my dad was able to go to university in Egypt for free. And that's where him and my mom met at university. And um, it was a big deal for her to go to her family and say that she wanted to marry a Palestinian man. She had one of her aunts tell her, I would prefer if you married an Egyptian garbage man than marry a Palestinian. And why did she Um, say that? There is a lot of inter-Arab racism, I guess. I'm not sure (laughs) what you would call it. Yeah, prejudice. Um, Yeah, yeah. A lot of of prejudice. There's uh, Palestinian people suffer a lot from a negative... um, reaction from other Arabs. And so that's something that my father was used to and something that my mom kind of took it as a point of pride that she was going to go against her her family's wishes and, and marry this Palestinian man anyway. But your mother went to university. And so would you say, because I think a lot of people in the West think that if people go to university, they're highly educated, they're cosmopolitan. And, you know, I always get this question, if your father went to university, why did he force you into marriage? So please share that context of this this young woman who's allowed to go to university, who then picks her own mate, and then she has to, at the same time, contend with the existing prejudices and uh, religious convictions. Describe just a little bit more what her life was like. Yeah, so she actually had a very charmed life when she was in Egypt. So like you mentioned, her great uncle was, uh, you know, the first president of Egypt. And so um, she came from money, she came from privilege. And she went to Christian schools, like Catholic schools when she was growing up, because her family wanted her to have French and English. And it was a very secular upbringing. But still, at the end of the day, it's a, a very sexist, patriarchal society. And, um, you know, even though she, w- she was privileged compared to other Egyptians, when her and my dad decided to go to San Francisco, her life as a woman was very different from the other women in the 60s in San Francisco, USA. So that's when you got to see the, you know, what's secular in Egypt is very different from what is, you know, liberal 
America. And secular in, in San Francisco, yeah. Yes, yeah. Especially in those days, very peace, love, and hippie days. And so she actually, the reason why she became fundamentalist later when she had us was more of a, I call her a born again Muslim. Yeah. So she thought that she would make up for all of her past where her family didn't raise her right as far as she saw. Um, they didn't raise her Muslim enough. And so she would spend the rest of her life trying to be extra Muslim. To but, but before we go there, and I think that it really is an interesting uh, part, but so she's in university, she meets this man, she goes to her family and she says, you know, I'm going to defy you all. I'm going to marry this man anyway. And in the Arab Muslim culture, even at that time, even among uh, highly educated liberal families, it is, well, in that case, uh, you are going to lose that protective shield of your relatives. Yes. And is that why she decides to, she and her husband decide to settle in Canada? Um, well, it wasn't why they decided to, to go to the States in the first place, but it's why when her relationship with my dad fell apart, she was very hesitant to go to her family for support because she felt like she had defied them by saying she wanted to marry this man. And so she didn't want to go back, you know, tail between her legs and admit that things had gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're absolutely right. Her family did hold it against her that she still decided to marry him. To marry him. And what about his family, your father's family? They're, all you say is Palestinian, but uh, and he was also in university. So uh, is it right to assume that he also came from a privileged family? Yes, he became. He came from a very secular family and also privileged. His parents um, were living in Saudi Arabia, owning businesses and, and uh, buildings, you know, real estate, of course, partially because in Saudi Arabia, a non-Saudi Arabian cannot actually own anything. Um, but, you know, they, they were, they were well, they were well off. Um, and he actually didn't become a born again Muslim. So yeah, but we, we, we'll get to the born again bit. I just want to know at mm -hmm. some point, these two young people who are attending university in the 1960s, one Palestinian, one mm -hmm. Egyptian, both of them defying their families, they make their way to North America and they decide to have a family. Um, and then what happens? You say in the book, your father leaves your mother. He just disappears. He just goes. Well, it was, um, he, he took the peace, love, and hippie thing a little too seriously, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he took the free love a little too seriously. And my mom didn't like that, of course. And she wanted him to be more of a family man and um, focus. Uh, you know, he was very much into the, the commune life and all that, that kind of stuff that was very popular in those days. And so that's why they moved to Canada, where yeah. I was born. Yeah. So part of the reason why they moved to Vancouver was to try and get away from that atmosphere in San Francisco at the time. And, um, but of course they moved to a different country, but their relationship still fell apart. So by the time I was, you know, my, I was a toddler, my parents were already well, divorced. Their marriage fell apart. And at that point, how many siblings do you have? There's, I have two. So I'm the third. You're the third. So then your father disappears out of your lives and your mother is left all by herself in what is for her the second foreign country with small children. And is that when she starts attending mosque? How does she make her way into from being very secular and married to this commune loving, you know, 60s free love hippie man to try to going to the mosque? Well, she had that same experience as the other Egyptian. I'm trying to remember his name. I can't believe I forgot his name right now. That other Egyptian that went to America and was like, oh, these Americans are so... Um, Say it's good. You know. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> the guy from Greeley. <laughs> yeah. I forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she kind of had his experience where she thought because of, you know, the experience with my dad and him leaving her, she thought, well, this country, this society, this liberalism, this freedom, all of it is just... Um, it's rotten know, to the core. Debaucherous. Yes, exactly. And 
also, like you said, she was looking for community, looking for support. She's, you know, a single mom to three kids. And so she went to the local mosque looking for community. And her mindset was already there where she was feeling like um, she is disgusted with the Western world. And so she was ripe and ready to be picked up by a fundamentalist person and to be, um, I guess, indoctrinated mm -hmm. into that world very quickly. Yeah. Um, and it ca so it comes from both sides. There is the existing vulnerability, material and moral, and then going to the mosque and finding someone who takes the lead. And that then is your stepfather. Yes. I don't like to call him that, but yes, um, I just... It's, it's a lot more cumbersome, but I mm. call him the man who my mother married. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he was somebody who, and going back to the whole patriarchal sexist attitude, um, even though she was a, you know, a forward thinking Egyptian, she's, it's still a very patriarchal society that she was raised in. And she felt like she needed to be connected to a man to be valuable, to be valued by society. Um, even if it's as a second wife, which she thought was the only thing that she would be able to get. Oh, so she was his anyway. second wife. Uh, mm -hmm. He was already married, yeah. And so at mm -hmm. that point in Canada, is that second marriage then recognized as a marriage or is it ignored? I mean, uh, the Canadian society, how do they respond to these arrangements? They ignore it entirely. And they can they can because at that point, uh, your mother, and I will keep calling him your stepfather, <laughs> it's just the language that makes Easier. it so so easy to mm -hmm. do it that way. What is their immigration status? Are they on welfare? Are there any? What are the ways in which they are confronted by the Canadian state so that they can, you know, if they were making their own money and they didn't have to do anything with the state, then they could hide these relationships? It would be a live yeah. and let live if you want to have three wives, ten wives. It's up to you. Um, but with their relationship with the state, uh, how, you know, how is it? Because these are the, one reason why you and I talk about this, and we'll get to that later, is that a lot of people in the West think that once you make your way from the Middle East or North Africa or these other places and you come here, you change. You just become like mm. everyone else magic magical it's magical yeah um so anyway how did do you think that the canadian government could have known that this was a second marriage that it's polygamous and so on yes because we were all living in the same house <laughs> and my mom was collecting welfare as a single mother so there was a bit of contention there because they suspected that she was married and therefore she shouldn't be collecting as a single mother um, but there was, you know, she legally wasn't married to him. Islamically, she was, but legally he was married to his first wife, not to her. So there was no... So only one way. marriage was recognized, even though Correct. benefits were given to the second wife. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, the hierarchy was very clear. The first wife lived upstairs in the, you know, the normal part of the house. And the second wife and her three children lived in the basement. Most of it was unfinished. Uh, you know, we lived next to the laundry room and, you know, that's, that's how we lived. It was very clear who the first wife was and who the second wife was, who the first children were and who the second children were. And that's within the dynamic of the household. And is that, would you say that that childhood that you describe, and really I urge everyone to read your book, that that is something unique to your family or did you see it among other families? Yes, because I attended an Islamic school. So everybody in all of my friends, everyone in our community were all Muslims. And I did see that. Um, so I didn't think it was too abnormal because it seemed normal. Everybody, you know, it was pretty common. Um, and of course, now that I'm doing this activism, I'm hearing from all sorts of people in Canada and America and the UK, you know, Scotland, France, everywhere with similar stories of um, living in, in polygamous families where in some cases there's, you know, a, not just a second wife, but a third and fourth wife. And each one of them is collecting 
um, welfare as a single mother. And so it uh, makes life easy for him. There's the welfare bit, but it's also what it does to the psyche of the child who's living under those circumstances and within that hierarchy. And so your relationship with your mother, your emotional relationship with the man she married and the children of the first wife who are living upstairs and you guys are living in the basement, you know, that's, how would you describe that? It's damaging to say the very least. I mean, you're, you're, you're very aware of the fact that you're second tier, that you're second class. Um, It's, 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 strange how these kinds of things are very normalized when you're living in it yeah so I think in the moment maybe I didn't think about how much it was affecting me um I can see it now very much you know leftover issues but um yeah it's unfortunately common enough that you don't you don't think about it. And, and another reason why you don't think about it is there's nothing you can do about it. So it feels very futile to even be upset about these things. Because you get on with surviving and survival with every day. And I think it's extraordinary that you make your way out of that. But before that happens, before you realize there is a different world out there, the man your mother married forces you to marry someone of his choosing. My mother was involved in that as well. Yeah, so obviously she's not, uh, you know, you can't say she was a victim and she was a part of it. She was absolutely responsible. Um, They decide you're going to marry, and you're 19 years old, and they decide who you're going to marry. And who is that? (sighs) And how old were you? Who is that? How old were you? How was the news broken to you? You know. So there's a, a little bit of background before this happened, which helps to you know lay the groundwork. I graduated from high school. I was 17, and my family went to Egypt on holiday. And then I woke up one morning, and they were gone. They'd gone back to Canada, and they just left me there. In Egypt. And I in Egypt, and. Um, when I was in Egypt, I was being forced to marry my second cousin. And I finangled my way out of that by saying I just wanted to come back to Canada to say goodbye to the country of my birth before I go to Egypt to to live there forever. Um, But of course, once I made it into Canada, I said to my mom, you know, unless you're going to, you know, duct tape me and put me kicking and screaming on that airplane, there's no way I'm going back. So I had already um, shown my mother that I was not going to just be complacent in her forcing me into a marriage. So where did you get that strength from? I think, I think at that time, at that time in my life, when I was in Egypt, away from my mom, I was just with one of my aunts who I loved and adored. And I was working for the first time. I had my own money. My aunt gave me freedom. I found my confidence in a way that I never would have been able to find it in Canada because I was so controlled. But in in Egypt, I had non-Muslim friends, my coworker, <laughs> yeah, Christian woman. And I I got a sense of autonomy and independence that gave me confidence to be able to stand up for myself. And so when I got back to Canada, I was still full of this, you know, newfound confidence. And so my mom needed to take care of that. And so that's why she said that she chose a man for me that would be, quote, strong enough to control me. Right. And I was so upset over that quote, um, because it was really planned. Like it was the fact that he was a, um, she knew he was in Afghanistan with bin Laden. She knew he was a terrorist. And it was like, 
that's what made her choose him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like I this know, man is I know. evil enough. I know. Evil and evil enough to control this girl. Do yeah. you know? Like, um, but Yasmin, a, isn't it from, uh, let's see, from your perspective and my perspective, and I can tell you this, uh, a large number of my audience, we all agree that, you know, Al-Qaeda and membership of Al-Qaeda and these are evil acts and evil beliefs, but from your mother's perspective and your stepfather's perspective, how do they see him? Not just as a man who can control you, but they see him as as a good man, as a pious man. And I think a lot of our, you know, people in the West don't understand that. How do you explain that perspective? Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, she would compare him to the Prophet Muhammad, actually. Um, she thought he was such a prime example of what a, a Muslim person should be. And it was such a gift that I would marry him. But there was a, there was a conscious effort in that, you know, she didn't marry me off to uh, a pious man who wasn't a terrorist. Right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like she chose it wasn't just because she believed he was a good Muslim man, which she did, of course, very much so. But it's because she also knew that I was the kind of person that would push back and that he would be somebody who she felt would keep me in line. Mm -hmm. And I guess the reason why it upsets me so much is because it worked. I mean, I, I was completely diminished when I was married to him. I wasn't even a shadow of, of my former self. So he certainly did succeed in what she wanted him to do. Um, but I guess I prefer to focus on the fact that in the end, I got away from both of them and neither of them were able to control me. So, Which is what I, it is really admirable. And that, that, that is the true true miracle that this this inner strength that uh, even though you felt diminished that came to the fore over and over again and when she's going to through this process of introducing you and saying okay here's this guy who's going to keep you in line at that time you are in Canada you're on Canadian soil did you ever consider going to the authorities and saying, here's this man whom I think is a terrorist and my family is planning to marry me off to him against my will. That's criminal. I need to be protected from these people. Yeah. So um, first of all, at that point, I didn't know he was a terrorist. They told me he was driving the Red Crescent van in uh, Afghanistan. So he was like a paramedic, apparently. Um, so that's that's what I was told about him. Secondly... You'll remember from my book when I was 12 years old, when I went to the authorities and asked them for help. And it was beyond treacherous for me to go to the non-believers for help. You know what kind of betrayal that would be from the, the Islamic community would see me as the rat, you know, if, if it's like the mafia. Yeah. You're going to the enemy to ask for help from your family. Like it was was so difficult for me to do that and in the end after it went through police and child services and the court system in the end the judge said to me um this is your family's culture and so in the in the interest of cultural freedom and religious freedom we're not going to protect you you have to stay with your family so i had already tried going to the authorities and i already had a door slammed in my face and so I wasn't about to do it again um, a few years later. I, I had learned that the authorities didn't care about me. I wasn't the right culture. So they weren't interested in supporting me. Um, but when I was eventually contacted by CSIS, who are the Canadian intelligence, like Canadian CIA, when they contacted me and told me, you're married to a member of Al Qaeda and they showed me pictures and, you know, 
then I felt like, oh, okay, so you guys actually do care. <laughs> you are interested in, in helping me. Um, up until then, I wouldn't have even bothered. That is, and again, it's the work that you've chosen to do informed by that experience, that there is a double standard, a true double standard where girls who are born, and even boys who are born into abusive cultures who face systematic, relentless abuse from their families are left out of the protection of the constitution and the law of the free country that they're born and raised in. Um, Absolutely. And I think there Absolutely. should be much more awareness for this um, in the age of wokeism. And we'll get there. But you, when the Canadian CIA come to you and you are able then to explain to them, look, uh, uh, he, he's a terrorist you're seeking, but he's been terrorizing me all these years. How do you manage to get out of that? Because in that, at that moment when you're talking to the uh, Canadian secret services or security forces, do you realize that at that moment you are going to be seen not only by your family, but Al-Qaeda as a traitor? Well, the way that they contacted me, I was never allowed out of the house, right? He had paper taped on the windows just in case the curtains moved and anybody saw in. So I was essentially under house arrest the whole time I was married to him. The only reason why CSIS were able to contact me was because my mom had a medical emergency and the ambulance came to pick her up. And I went in the ambulance with her, with my young daughter at the time. And at the hospital, so he wasn't there. And my mom was in a hospital room with the doctors. And so I was alone for the first time in the entire marriage. They caught me that one How moment. How many years was, was the marriage? Five in total. Five in total, yeah. So for five years, you don't, set, you, you don't get out of the house. And here's an opportunity, yeah. Yeah, and so um, I know now that they had been following him. They'd been watching his moves, you know, FBI were onto him and everything. So that explains why they were able to find me the one moment I was alone. But at the, t um, so I wasn't afraid of him finding out or of my mom finding out because it was, he didn't even know I was in the hospital at that time. So I wasn't concerned about that. But when they did contact me, it felt like a beacon of light because I had a daughter at this time and when she was maybe a week old, and you know how it is when you're a mom holding your week old baby, you're just filled with so much, uh, just this, this huge sense of protection. You just want to protect your baby so much, especially when they're so fragile and young. Mm -hmm. And he came up behind me. So I just heard his voice and I didn't see his face and it just made it more sinister. I remember so distinctly him saying, when are we gonna, when are we gonna take her to get her fixed? When are we gonna take her to get her cleaned? When is she gonna get cleaned? I said, what do you mean? She just took a bath. Mm. And then my mom said, oh, no, no, no. When she's older, we'll do that. When she's five or six, we'll take her to Egypt and we'll get it done. And this is to have her undergo female genital mutilation. That's what they exactly. call purification, right? Yes. And it's almost as popular in Egypt as it is in Somalia. So in Egypt, it's like 87% or something. In Somalia, it's over 90. Yeah. But it's very commonly done in Egypt. And, um, oh man, was I petrified in that moment. I felt like grabbing her and just jumping out of the window. And the fact that my mom responded with saying, it'll, you know, we'll wait till she's five or six years old. It told me, okay, you have five or six years to get out of this situation before your daughter gets mutilated. Yeah. Because at that point I had a high school education. This is before Facebook. This is before cell phones. There were no friends. I'd lost contact with everybody. And did you uh, yourself that's the first thing an abuser does. So Yasmin, did you yourself, when you were a child, did you undergo female genital mutilation? 
No, I didn't. And as far as I know, nobody in my mother's family did either. Okay, so you want to protect your daughter. You know what it entails, and you think I have only five years, six years before they get to her. And then CSIS contact me, and they tell me you're married to a terrorist. And so I felt like, well, maybe they'll help me. Maybe they'll help me to get out because I want to get out. I want to protect my daughter. I don't want her to live the same life that I just lived, even worse, because he wanted to go to Peshawar. And that was the plan. And um, they weren't willing to help me escape. Um, but just knowing that they were on to him, I guess, gave me a sense of, of uh, courage. Um, but I didn't leave right away. I wasn't able to leave right away. It was through a very, you know, almost surreal set of circumstances that almost didn't happen. I just, I was pregnant a second time and I felt like, well, this is it. I'm not going to be able to be a single mom to two kids, you know, halas, that's it. I'm going to Peshawar. We're going to become a jihadi family. I give up. And then I found out that the baby didn't have a heartbeat. I'm sorry. And um, as it was a very, you know, I was absolutely devastated over that and felt like it was my fault because I was raging and I was upset that I was pregnant with a, a second child. Um, but when I went in for my DNC surgery, I, don't, I still don't even know how I had the brain to do this. But when I went in for my DNC surgery, the, the nurse said to me, you're going to be a bit groggy because I was going under general anesthetic. She said, you're going to be groggy afterwards. You're going to need someone to help you with your little daughter for maybe 24 hours or so. So maybe go to your mom's or something. And so I told him, I need to go to my mom's for a week. It's going to take me a week to recover because I wanted to give myself some time. And I knew, I knew that getting into my mom's house would be easier to escape than if I were still in his house. With the, so that's with the curtains taped and exactly. every movement of yours monitored, right? There's no escape. Um, and so he, of course, wasn't willing to help me with our daughter for seven days. So he said, yes, fine, go live with your mother. And my mom was the head of the Islamic studies department at the Islamic school at the time. So she got up in the morning to go to school and I knew she would be home by you know, she's me finished work at three o'clock or whatever. And so I had a sh short window of opportunity to grab my daughter and find a lawyer, you know, search through the yellow pages to find a lawyer close by who was willing to give me a free half an hour consultation where I told her that I needed full custody, a restraining order and a divorce and that she couldn't contact me that I would call her, but she couldn't call me because uh, of course I was in my mom's place. And, you know, she was able to do that for me. And, and I gave her just whatever information I knew, but somehow she made it happen. I was nervous. I didn't know if she was gonna make it happen or not. But of course, then I, he came to my mom's place. She was living in an apartment building, screaming in Arabic give me back my wife. And I was petrified that he was going to get into the building. But of course, you know, six foot four <laughs> Egyptian man screaming in Arabic. Nobody let him in the building. And I called 911 and they were very aware already. They said they'd gotten many phone calls about this man. Mm. And the reason why he came screaming like that is because he'd been served with the divorce papers. Mm. So... That's how I knew he was, he'd been served. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for this, if it wasn't for these events happening exactly the way they did, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. It was, it was just completely serendipitous. Like, It is so fascinating grateful. on so many different levels. Is your personal strength and the personal circumstances that are, taking place there and then 
the fam family dynamics and then there is just the Canadian society that prides itself on being free and liberal and forward-looking and progressive and they go all over the world trying to preach to people uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, countries with dictatorships to live the Canadian way and right there under their noses things like this are taking place so the one question that's now racing through my mind is and I, I mean, I know the answer to that, but I have to ask you. When they realize, no, I'll put, I'll put the question differently. Your mother was head of the Islamic Center. Mm -hmm. Your ex-husband is a member of Al-Qaeda, the Canadian CIA after him. You are this victim of domestic violence along with your daughter. You make that escape. Does your mother just continue being head of the Islamic society? Does that organization just continue to exist? What becomes of him? Where does he end up? Uh, yes, there were no issues with my mom continuing. Um, everything sailed on as usual. And with him, I learned later, so through you know his Wikipedia page um, and you know, journalists writing about him, I learned that he ended up wanting to go fight in Croatia, which is where the fight was at the time. He wanted to die for Sibililla. He wanted to die in the name of Allah. As, jih as a jihadi. So he, he needed to die as a jihadi. That's what he wanted. The thing that scared him the most was um, dying in some other way. Dying in Mubarak's prison was his biggest fear, right. which is where he ended up being. I mean, now it's Sisi's prison, but um, he ended up being in prison in Egypt, which was, he really wanted to die in the name of Allah, somehow, somewhere. Right. And uh, it turns out that the FBI were looking for somebody else. They were, you know, uh, staking out a, a hotel room where they're expecting somebody else. And then they found him. And so they arrested him. And then they find out who he was. He's a member of Al-Jihad. And so uh, he got arrested and, and sent to Egypt. Now, Egypt had already revoked his citizenship prior because they knew that he was a jihadi from when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. He entered Canada with a fake passport, fake Saudi Arabian passport from Afghanistan. Like you couldn't ask for more red flags. Right. Yeah. <laughs> An Egyptian person with a fake Saudi Arabian passport coming from Afghanistan. Gee, I wonder why he's coming to Canada. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, he didn't, he didn't uh he didn't have Egyptian citizenship, but they sent him there to go to prison. And then he was let out briefly under Morsi. And then he was caught again in Malaysia in another terrorist attempt activity exactly another terrorist attempt so he's just been you know single-mindedly seeking to die as a to... jihadi Correct. and where is he now has he achieved his goal no not he's actually in prison in egypt his worst nightmare what about your mother i haven't had any contact with her in close to 20 years um but from the one uncle who speaks to me she is getting more fundamentalist by the day, which is not too surprising. It's a, it's a trend that the older you get mm -hmm. with some Muslim people, and this definitely happens and has happened in my family, um, the more religious they become because they feel like they're closer to death. And so they have to try and do as many, you know, be as pious as possible before judgment day. And she knows of your activism. She knows that you, you know, have told the whole world. I assume she does. Yeah. Um, my uncle knows. I sent him my book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I don't talk to him about her, and he doesn't talk to me about her because it's, um, it's not a positive thing you know it, it's just it's just a very you know it's a very difficult conversation to have he's he's 
He's been living in New York ever since he was in his early 20s. So he's an open-minded, you know, liberal Muslim man. And is that and uncle from your mother's side or from your father's side? Yeah. Mother's no, side. No, from my mom's side. It's yeah. my mom's brother. Yeah. So he's the only one out of my whole family that you are. who speaks to me because he's the only one who is what you would call these days a moderate Muslim. Now, right. he's not a reformer by any means. He's not involved in any kind of activism. But, you know, he listens to music. He uh, lives a normal life. You know, he interacts with non-Muslim friends, you know. Um, so that's why he is okay with knowing me. As yeah, his niece. I get uh, also a lot uh, on my you know questions about my relationship with my mother and i didn't speak to her for many years and then uh, we started speaking again obviously we avoid uh, anything that has to do with her role in her uh, in her expression of her self as a muslim and the way she raised us the abuse all of that not a word about that um But would you ever, do you ever think of a scenario when you think you could have a conversation with your mother, even if it's just, you know, mother, daughter? The thing is, Ayan, my mom made it clear to me that she wanted me dead. So I think that it's crossed a line already. Um, she didn't even, it was, it was like a logical, emotionless state yeah. of fact. And this will okay. make sense to you that she just was, she saw me without hijab in public for the first time. And she just was like, oh, well, if you're taking off your hijab, then the next step is you're going to leave Islam. And so I make, I need to make sure that you're killed before you leave Islam, because I'm not going to spend my eternity suffering for right. your sins. I'm not going to be punished by Allah because I raised an infidel daughter. So I'll need to make sure you're killed before you become an infidel. And at the time I was like, what are you talking about? I'm Muslim. I'm just not wearing hijab. I had no intentions of leaving the religion. Um, but it was still not the fact that I had strayed from the yeah. straight path enough meant that she needed to have me killed. And this was not an empty threat. I mean, she had threatened me with that many times growing up all the time. And we'd had honor killings in Canada that were, were you know, that drove the point home that it was very possible. In those days, she would say, I'll just bury you in the backyard and tell people you moved to Egypt. It'd be as easy as that. And we had friends from the Islamic school who would disappear and they'd be told, they tell us, oh yeah, she got married in Pakistan and that's it. There's no way of contact. How many them. Muslim girls do you think know this? Because in conversations, private conversations, uh, uh, through your activism, my activism, we've had that sentence over and over again. You'll just get buried in the backyard. Um, Sometimes I wonder how many girls are buried in a backyard somewhere in Canada or the U.S. or Um, it, it's too gruesome a question to contemplate, but we know that it happens. We know that we've been told she just went off on holiday or country of origin and disappears and no one really looks for her. No one looks for these victims. Currently, right now, there's a, a young girl in Italy who was 17 or 18 years old, refused to marry her cousin from Pakistan that her parents were forcing her to marry. And the last image they have from the cameras in their building is her family walking with shovels. And her family are all in Pakistan now and nobody has heard from the girl. So, you know, two plus two is four. It's very obvious what they did and what happened to her, but they have no proof. And the body, and, the body has you know, not been found, willing, I know of that, yeah. That body yeah. has not been found. But I mean, even with the, the story, you know, you know, Benaz, uh, um, there's a documentary called Benaz, A Love Story, and they also made an ITV um, miniseries about it called Honor, which is about a young Kurdish Iraqi girl named Benaz who 
They found her body buried in the backyard of her family's home, shoved in a suitcase, but her family had all gone off to Iraq. So this one detective was willing to follow these men to Iraq, but normally once the people leave, that's it, they're untouchable. They, their crime is, is forgotten. There are perpetrators who left, families who left after killing their daughters and even their gay sons. Um, and there are still families who didn't leave, who are here in North America and in yeah. different parts of Europe. Um, and there are detectives who know, there are people who know, and there are school teachers who know, there are so service providers who know. And they're all just too terrified to talk about it. And I think, I don't know what it's going to take um, for our societies to come to the conclusion that these are human beings who are worth uh, the protection of the law and who are worth getting some justice. And these, this type of honor violence needs to be stopped. Your book is called Unveiled, and I recommend it to everyone to read. If you want to understand what happens in a place like Canada to a Canadian girl uh, living and going to school there and interacting with the Canadian society and yet having to undergo all of these horrors of forced marriage and polygamy, and in your case even, the, you know, Al-Qaeda activism. Uh, please, everyone, read Yasmin Mohammed's book, Unveiled. Yasmin, I thank you so, so much for sharing your story with me. And I also thank you so much for your activism. And I want to call on everyone listening to donate to your organization, Free Hearts, Free Minds, because what you do is that you give all the girls who are in similar circumstances the courage and the hope to stand up, to get out, to keep on looking through that window and keep thinking there is a way out, there is a way out. And with your activism, with the money you raise, I know you pull those girls out of these prisons. Uh, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this, Yasmin. Thank you so much, Ayan. All I do is hope to follow your example. You were that light for me. And I hope to just pay it forward with hopefully helping others as well. Thank you. You're my hero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of my podcast. We've added a new feature for subscribers to my website, podcast transcriptions. If you subscribe, you can now access transcriptions for every podcast conversation. Subscribe today at ianhirsiali.com.